My name is Kenneth Talbot. My email is krt200 at email.vccs.edu if you want more information. The topic today is so you want to be a leader. It's encouraging to see people interested because a lot of the problems we have in the country today are solely because we lack the leadership that we need in our government, in our commercial setting, in our churches. Um, so it's encouraging to see that you have enough interest that you would like to become a leader. Leadership is influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation while operating to accomplish the mission and improving the organization. That's in the U.S. Army Field Manual. Um, our military has done the best job of defining leadership and actually developing leadership programs. Today, uh, writers who address leadership, more and more they define it in terms of directly uh, gaining others' acceptance and commitment to a common vision. Um, this boils down to communications. You must communicate a, a vision of where you want the organization to be. And then people know uh, in what direction to pull. Leadership includes the ability to inspire. Um, people have to make a willing and voluntary commitment to the organizational goals to, for you to be successful as a leader. Good leaders are able to overcome resistance to change. Nobody likes change, but change is a fact of life. Um, a good leader is able to broker the needs of constituent groups. <laughs> Let's break that down. Broker, I represent, uh, a good leader can represent your requirements as a team member, but he can also represent the needs of the organization so that you understand why you're doing what it is that you're being asked to do. And, and equally important, a good leader establishes an ethical framework in which you operate. Uh, so often today we see breakdowns uh, in sports, in business, in government, um, of people uh, um, charged with corruption, people going to jail for illegal activities. This is all, it goes back to the leadership and the fact that this ethical framework was not established. There are two words that get us into trouble. Um, Responsibility and accountability. Although team members may be held accountable for results, the leader is ultimately responsible. Authority can and should be delegated. Responsibility cannot be delegated. Authority flows from the top of the organization. The breakdown usually occurs at the level at which someone says, I'm going to hold you responsible. No, I'm not going to give you the authority, but if it doesn't work, I'm going to hold you responsible. The proper word is accountability, and that's the one that we should use more often than not instead of responsibility. So good leaders are committed to the job, they're committed to the people, they are good communicators, and, and they're persuasive. You must first learn to follow before you can become a leader. Now how do we facilitate change? Which Primarily is what leaders are called upon to do. <clears throat> Again, a clear vision, corresponding goals, quantified goals, exhibit a strong sense of responsibility. And here, responsibility is a proper word because we have to assume responsibility. You give, hold me accountable, okay, I will assume that responsibility. Assuming responsibility is a personal thing. Be effective communicators. You must have a high energy level and you must be flexible and willing to change. Now this slide is the essence of, of leadership. You can use these one, two, three, four, five characteristics either to evaluate a person, is that person a good leader? Or if you wish to become a good leader, you apply these to yourself. First of all, self-awareness. Knowing one's emotions, strengths, weaknesses, drives, values, goals, and their impact on others. You must know yourself. Um, uh, example, self-confidence, a, a realistic self-assessment, and frequent self-assessment. Self-deprecating sense of humor. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. If somebody makes fun at you, of you, don't get uh, angry. Laugh along with them. Uh, 
And most importantly, the self-awareness is that last item, thirst for constructive criticism. You must always be asking your peers, your boss, your friends, well, how, how did we do on that? How did I do on that? Uh, give me some feedback. Because that feedback is, is uh, that feedback cycle is what you use to improve. Self-regulation is another component of a leader. Controlling or redirecting disruptive emotions and impulses. You get mad. Do you slam the door and hit the ball? No. You count to ten and you keep your keep your temper and uh, you regulate, you self-regulate these disruptive emotions. You don't wait for someone to call you down and say, don't do that. Uh, you learn to control yourself. Uh, Self-regulation uh, uh, leads to trustworthiness, integrity, and comfort with ambiguity and change. In other words, you're in a situation you don't understand it, you don't know what's going on. Well, you don't get disruptive and, and start demanding answers and you, you stay calm and you listen and you observe. Motivation, being driven to achieve for the sake of achievement. Um, a lot of times in younger people, uh, motivation is the challenging part. Uh, you have to have a passion for the work itself. You have to have a passion for new challenges. Uh, unflagging energy to improve. Constant process improvement, constant personal improvement, constant organizational improvement. Uh, all of that is part of uh, not only leadership, but, but uh, part of the definition of management. And you must be optimistic even in the face of failure. Uh, I know you've heard, make, uh, if you're given lemons, make lemonade. Uh, empathy, consider others' feelings, especially when making decisions. Um, empathy is important. Uh, you need expertise in attracting and retaining talent. To retain the talent, you have to be empathetic to their needs, their wants, their, their, their goals. You need the ability to develop others. As you, um, as we talk more about what it is to be a leader, you'll see that most of what you accomplish, you're going to have to accomplish through other people. If we were only able to um, accomplish things on our own, then we wouldn't. There are only 40 hours in a working week, uh, 12 useful hours in a day. There's not enough time for us to accomplish very much as an individual. But if we can leverage ourselves through others by developing our, our, our leadership abilities, then we can uh, accomplish significantly more. Social skills, managing relationships to move people in desired directions. Um, this effectiveness, effectiveness in leading change. We could have uh, several uh, hours of uh, lecture on uh, accomplishing change, uh, but you need to learn to manage change, to welcome change. Persuasiveness, extensive networking, expertise in building and leading teams. Uh, there's, we have a team course here that I teach on occasion that is, is very good. Uh, now, if you will embrace these, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills, um, and try to develop these in yourself, what you'll find over time is that people start to turn to you automatically as a leader. The leader isn't necessarily the person that's assigned the job of managing the effort, but the leader is the person to whom people turn when they need direction, uh, they need encouragement, they need uh, uh, some sympathy, some empathy. Uh, um, so if you're self-aware, if you regulate, self-regulate, if, you're, if you show motivation, you're, you're empathetic, and you have uh, a modicum of social skills, then you will emerge as a leader. Whether or not your boss assigns you the, the management role um, within the group, this is how you become a leader. Now this is, I encourage you to review this slide more uh, and frequently than any of the others. This is the most important slide. As you can see, it actually came from a Harvard Business Review uh, article. Uh, what makes a leader, and it's, a, it's still in print and it's available from HBR. Now, from here, th these slides talk about how um, you can um, cement your role as a leader. Um, it's not a one-way street. You, you, you become more and more effective as time goes by, and then you make a mistake and you back up 
and you have to start building it yourself back up again. These points are uh, aimed at um, preventing you from backsliding. Um, you must have the trust of the people that you're trying to lead. How do you obtain that trust? Number one, you accept responsibility. Not accountability, you are responsible. If the effort fails, you are responsible. Not They're not, your team members are not. This is the, the military model that is so effective. Uh, you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. You share the credit. When things go well, you don't say, I did that. Look at our national leaders today. How many times did they use the word I? I did this, I did that. No. Uh, in fact, you should prune that word from your vocabulary. We did this. We accomplished that. Um, the only time you say I is when you say, I screwed up. Then you're take the responsibility. Otherwise, it's we. Learn to delegate authority. Um, especially in a young organization or with people with whom you're not completely familiar, this may be difficult, but you must delegate them the authority so that they can make the decisions um, and learn how to fail, learn how to succeed. Uh, you have to be consistent. Now, you don't have to be consistently nice. You don't want to be consistently bad. But when people come to you, they, they need to be able, be able to predict the way in which you're going to respond. If they can't predict, they won't share with you. They won't bring a problem to you. When they come to you, even if it's bad news, they need to know, okay, he's going to blow up for 60 seconds, and then he'll calm down, and we'll have a mature discussion about, even that's okay, because it's predictable. Um, the other way, and this was very important, particularly as you uh, move into a role where you directly influence compensation is rewards must be equitably distributed. Uh, and this can be this can be quite difficult, uh, particularly um, in light of uh, perhaps overriding corporate rules that limit your, that limit you. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Leadership styles, there there's a participative style in which you provide guidance. The leader gets involved only when necessary. Uh, the leader enthusiastically accepts work and decisions of the employees. He helps others to analyze and solve the problems. And he recognizes employees for seeking support. Another leadership style is consultative. Consultative leader seeks input, advice, and suggestions. But the consultative leader, she makes the final decision. And this could be very difficult. I had a longtime friend and employee that I would go to. He was a real sage. I would ask his advice. And he would say, well, why? You're not going to do it anyway. And I would try to explain, Bob, I'm not asking you to make the decision. I value your input. I'm going to take your input along with several other people whom I trust. And I'm going to make the decision. But your input is important. So the consultative leader does make the final decision. But uh, the consultative leader, she does recognize employees for the contributions they make to them. The delegating leader who delegates authority, uh, assigns accountability, not responsibility, assigns accountability. I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Uh, I can, many times in my career I've been told, I'm going to hold you responsible for that. And that just kind of makes me, kind of irks me. I don't, um, because I did, I did, was first trained as a military leader. Le uh, a delegating leader provides minimal input. You know how to do your job, go do it. Provides, he provides recognition, verifies the work, and recognizes employees for being accountable for what they accomplished. The directing leader engages in unilateral decision making, expects employees to follow rules, follow the follow orders. These are the rules followed. Um, I can give some examples of that. I, I used to, at one point in my career, I managed a manufacturing facility. I had very strict rules about housekeeping. I got people throwing stuff on the floor. I enforced that rigidly because if they knew, if they throw something on the floor, they're going to get in trouble. They wouldn't dare break one of the more important rules because they knew that, that rules were important and everyone had to, had to follow them for a, 
um, productive workplace. Gives information about what to do, gives information about why it should be done, and again, recognizes employees for following directions. Thank you for doing what I told you to. Even if it didn't have the desired outcome, you did exactly what I said. Now, there's a place for all of these. We talked about distribution of rewards. Uh, equity, the equity method is contribution based. That's the most important, the most effective. That's our capitalist system. He who contributes the most gets the greatest reward. And the equality method is socially based and everybody gets the same. And unfortunately today with the economic situation like it is, a lot of companies will say, okay, everybody gets two percent raise. Well, that kind of ties the leader's hands when he wants to recognize those who have made a more significant contribution. It's demoralizing, uh, but it's the easiest. I don't have to justify why, why she got a huge raise and he got nothing. And then need method is rarely found. Sometimes you run into it. Well, I had to give her a raise because she was a single mom raising several, ch and she had big bills and. A need base is uh, is rare today, at least in, in our culture. But, and of course, the words capitalism, socialism, communism, uh, you can view those that way as far as, it, because it, this says distribution of rewards, this equally applies to distribution of resources that a society might have. Now we talked about the leadership styles. Um, you, you, you must learn all of those. You can't simply say, I'm going to be a, um, co a collaborative leader and a participative leader. Leadership, leadership styles might vary from one person to another depending upon their readiness, um, which is characterized by the skills they have, their abilities to perform the work, and their confidence, commitment, and motivation to do it. Now, basically, we have people that are unable and unwilling to work. Here it requires an authoritarian type leader that says these are the rules and you will do this. Then we have people that are unable, but they're willing, they're anxious, they want, they want to learn. Um, then we have people that are able to do it, but they're not willing. Are you sure I can do that? I'm not going to. Um, and then ideally, uh, we have motivated our team to the point that everybody's able and willing. So the leadership styles, if they're unable and unwilling, you have to be a directing leader. If they're unable but they're willing, then you coach them. Say, okay, I, I know you're very willing to do this. Let me let me teach you, let me train you, come to me if you have questions, and I will coach you and and, and before long you will you will be accomplishing this on your own. If they're able but unwilling, then you have to be supportive. You have to say, I know that you don't like this but it's the decision that, that we have made and in order for our success, you need to apply your skills and, and see that this happens. Then able and willing, you simply delegate. Uh, I was employed for uh, 40 some years. And in 40 years, I've had probably three or four people that I could turn to and say, I want this done. And that's all I have to say. They did whatever was required, and in the allotted amount of time, they came back and it was accomplished. Um, I was very lucky to, to have had that many. Many people work and never have uh, any employees like that. Was it because of their particular talents, or was it because of the leadership I provided? Uh, who knows? Now, one of the goals, as many would say, the primary goal of your college education is to learn to think critically. Um, in order to think critically, you have to accumulate a body of knowledge, you have to learn to exercise judgment, you have to, well, these are some of the uh, guidelines for critical thinking. First, when given a set of facts, you need to distinguish between those which can be verified and those that are simply value claims. Oh, well, it's got, it's got four wheels and a 300 horsepower engine, and it's the best car made. Well, which of those is the value claim? Probably the best car made. You need to distinguish the relevant from the irrelevant information, the irrelevant claims, or the irrelevant reasons. Uh, you need to determine the factual accuracy of the statement. 
you need to determine the credibility of the source. Um, this is that's probably one of the biggest reasons you want to learn to think critically. When somebody tells you something, do not repeat that unless you thought about it critically and you feel that it is accurate. Because if you repeat it, then you're 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 taking uh, responsibility for that statement. And if it turns out to be false, then you're going to look like an idiot too. So best to uh, listen, nod, go away, do some research, and decide, you know, is that something I want to repeat or not? Uh, this especially goes to those emails that you get unsolicited, um, making outlandish claims about everything, government, life, science. Uh, identify unstated assumptions. Uh, when people are, uh, make a, uh, an argument, they will um, make statements that are really assumptions. Detect bias. Does this person speaking have um, a particular point of view and they're trying to convince me to assume that point of view? Sometimes there'll be logical fallacies. If A then B, B then C, does that mean A then C? Maybe not. Uh, um, you need to learn to recognize the logical inconsistencies in the line of reasoning. Um, and determine the strength of an argument or claim. These are just the many uh, articles that address critical thinking. Um, hopefully some of your courseware will address it while you're here at CDCC. But it's something that uh, before you repeat, you need to think about things critically and decide whether or not it should be. And now how do I succeed as a leader? Well, prioritize. This applies to you as an individual, to any organization, whether it be your church or your scout troop or uh, your, your production facility. Uh, first has to be quality. Maintain the highest level of quality because if the quality is poor, then nothing else matters. You're going to, the organization is going to cease to exist. Uh, and of course, this is generic. It could be, uh, um, again, it could be a church. It could be a, uh, a, a, a a civics organization. Um, the second thing to prioritize is anything that's a bottleneck to your output. If it's a manufacturing facility, you want to look for production bottlenecks. Uh, if it's a charitable organization, you want to look at what are the bottlenecks that are preventing us from providing these charitable services to the population that we've chosen to serve. And then and only then uh, prioritize issues that address cost. Cost is the is the lowest on the list. Now, a lot of times you'll be in a situation where your boss says you got to cut cost. Well, you cannot cut costs at the cost of quality or at the cost of introducing uh, bottlenecks to your output. Uh, so, always keep cost in proper perspective. Learn how to manage. Uh, the first thing to do is remember this acronym. Plan, organize, lead, and control. Those are the elements of management. Um, there are course, courses and tools that address um, certainly planning, plenty of planning tools. Plan your day once a day, plan your week once a week, plan your month once a month, plan your year once a year. It, um, those are specific activities that you should engage in. Um, organize, how, how to organize the resources that you have. Um, lead, lead these, uh, this planned and organized team for success. And that's what this topic today is about, it's the leadership part. And then control, control is the hardest, nobody wants controls, but that's why at the end of the day or at the end of the week you have reports. Because when you plan, you set goals, quantify goals. Well, the controls is the feedback are we making that goal? Are we making that goal? Are we making that goal? If your goal is to build a house and you're going to finish it in six months, if you don't have a plan with milestones along the way, six months goes by and you, well, we got the footers dug, but that's it, the house isn't built. You have to have controls in place. The more effective your controls are, the quicker you get feedback that the train's off the tracks and the quicker you can correct. Now this one, <laughs> I, I've developed over the years and I tried to teach people this. Uh, you can't afford to have a bad day. 
you spend weeks and weeks building relationships, people start to respect you and and you're their leader, and then you get up one morning and you didn't sleep and you got a headache and you feel bad and you go to work. First person you see, you shout at, and then you go off half cock because somebody brought you bad news. Uh, and it, each, what, what you do with each of those um, instances, you tear down all that relationship that you have been building for weeks and weeks, and you have to start over. And it's a lot harder the second time. So I'm not exaggerating. If, if you know that you're having a horrible day, at least go in your office and shut the door. If you don't have an office, stay home. Take a sick day. Uh, um, but in, in developing and maintaining relationships, you cannot afford to have a bad day. The price is just, the price you have to pay is just too high. Uh, I tell people this, if you work in engineering, you'll probably be required to keep a, a, a logbook. Um, but keep a journal. Um, it eases the creation of activity reports. I remember when I first started working as an engineer, we had to do monthly engineering reports. At the end of the month, I would sit down and, oh my God, I didn't do anything. For 30, well, once I started keeping my, um, uh, my, my lab journal, then I could just flip back through the journal and write down. Um, the second one is pretty important. It provides a birthday for patent protection. Uh, for instance, the integrated circuit. Uh, uh, a gentleman named Shockley is, is given all the credit simply because he wrote his down and he had it dated 30 days before the nearest competitor. So he gets all the credit. The other people didn't document their work, they got no credit. Um, it allows you to capture data insignificant at the time, but later, uh, as a trend develops, wait a minute, that happened, that happened three times before. You flip out, yes, yes, yes. And that's caused by, and so you can, it, so the data that you capture might be insignificant at the moment, but later prove invaluable. And will allow you to rebuild a chronology of events when you're testifying uh, or whatever. Um, this I always try to teach, is particularly new managers, um, at the beginning of every day when you get to the office, sit down and look at all the items that you've got to do. I would say look in the box and see what you've got to do that day. Pick out the two or three that you hate the most. I really don't want to call that guy, so put that at the top of the list. I really don't want to go downstairs and explain that expense report, so put that at the second. Well, dispose of those one or two things first, and then the rest of the day is just a joy. It's downhill. Nothing, you're not dreading anything. But if you come in and say, yeah, i got to call that mad, angry customer, but I'll do it after lunch, then you probably won't get around to doing it, and another 24 hours will pass, and by the time you do call him, he's really going to be angry. So um, the prioritization algorithm is look at what you've got to do, and pick the things that you hate the most. And if you do that consistently, that, that'll, those things will turn out to be those which you should have done, right? Don't try to prioritize it based on, well, this is, this is gonna cost us a lot of money, or that was gonna hurt quality, or uh, as far as your personal uh, action items, do the ones you hate the most. Um, how many of you daydream? I learned to daydream at an early age. Uh, this theater of your heart is where you can play all kinds of uh, things that uh, uh, aren't even possible in the real world, I guess. Um, there's several points. Uh, daydreaming is very important to you. Number one, you need to replay over and over the future that you wish to see. When I was about 12, I, uh, my neighbor took me for an airplane ride. And I decided I wanted to learn how to fly. So every night when I laid down, I would see myself flying. I don't know, I'd take off, I'd fly here, I'd fly there. Well, at 14, I started taking flying lessons and soloed. And at 15, I got my private pilot's license. Because I could see, I saw myself doing that. I knew I was going to be successful. There was no doubt. Um, now, conversely, you should see nothing in this theater of your heart that you don't wish to exist in reality. If you lay down at night and you imagine, I'm gonna punch that guy out someday, sooner or later, you're gonna punch him out. 
and you're going to pay the price for it. Whether it be punching somebody, perhaps uh, breaking up with your girlfriend, divorcing your wife, heaven forbid. Uh, so if it's something that has a ne don't don't dwell on that, don't think about it, certainly don't play it over and over in your mind. As gratifying as it might be when you feel your fist hitting it, no, don't do it. The point is, in order to succeed, you must envision yourself being successful. Um, that is the key. If you can see yourself doing it, then you will accomplish it. We've talked about management, we've talked about leadership, and we've said management, plan, organize, lead, and control. Management is a function that includes planning and budgeting and evaluating and facilitating. Whereas leadership is a relationship. It involves selecting the right people, motivating them, coaching them, and building trust. Um, uh, it, it's hard to define. I gave you a, 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 the uh, Army Fuel Manual definition of leadership up front. It's hard to define leadership. Everybody knows it when they see it, but, but you can't put your finger on what is it. Leadership styles, we went over before. Uh, autocratic, democratic, participative, goal. These are different names. Of course, situational, um, depending upon the situation in which you're in and the capabilities of the people that you're trying to lead, you might have to adopt the autocratic or the democratic or the, you know, et cetera. And it depends upon the leadership style you adopt uh, has to be based upon the um, expertise, the training, the motivation of those that you're trying to lead. Now this slide um, I used in a quality course that came from demystifying Six Sigma. Um, if, if we're going to accomplish change, we have to have a vision, we have to have the skills required, we have to have the proper incentives, we've got to have the resources, dollars, floor space, equipment, and we have to have a plan. If, if all of those are in place, then change will take place. If you find yourself in a situation where everybody's confused and nothing's happening, it's probably because there's no vision. Um, and so ask yourself, do we know what it is we're supposed to be doing? And, and your corrective action would be to uh, write down that vision statement and make sure everybody understands here's where we're supposed to be going. If there's a lot of anxiety, it might be because you know that you've got to operate on this person but you're a thoracic surgeon, but this is brain surgery. So you don't have the skills you need. There's going to be a lot of anxiety if you've never cut a person's head open before. So if there's anxiety, take an inventory. Make sure that you have all the skills represented on the team so that you can accomplish the goal. If there's no incentives in place, then you'll probably accomplish change, but it will occur gradually, much slower than, than uh, requested. If you don't have the resources, I want you to build that bridge, but you've only got two people to do it. Well, without resources, that's just going to lead to frustration because you know you you know what needs to be done. You've got the skills, you've got the proper incentive, you got a plan, but you just don't have the resources that are required. And finally, with no plan, uh, you start you lurch in this direction. Then somebody says, "Oh no, no, let's do it." Okay, so you back up, then you lurch in that direction, and and you you have a lot of false starts. Uh, so in order for change to be effective, and change again is a is one of the major things that people turn to leadership for. Uh, they turn to leadership to help us make this change. The, the vision, vision skills, incentive, resources, and an action plan. That's how you will accomplish the change that you've been asking. Now I like this chart. It's kind of hard. The words are. Everybody talks about compromise. If we look at the x-axis and the y-axis, <clears throat> the x-axis is the concern for the other person or the empathy, whereas the, the vertical axis is concern for yourself, self-interest or self-preservation. Uh, if I'm not concerned about the other person and I'm really not concerned about myself, then it's just an avoidance, still me. Whereas if I'm overly concerned about the other person, there's too much empathy and less concern about my own self-interest, there's accommodation or capitulation. Okay, just do it your way. Whereas if I'm overly concerned about my own, then that results in, in a 
unhealthy competition and intimidation. So everybody likes to say, what's well, just compromise? Compromise is really a bad word. Because compromise means you gave up and they gave up, and you end up somewhere in the middle um, that is not the ideal solution. In order to um, maximize the empathy for the other people and maximize your own self-interest, what we need is collaboration. And that's the win-win up in that top right corner. If you ever get the opportunity to take a gaming course, it's not about video games. It's about game theory, zero-sum games, positive-sum games, um, the win-win. Well, the win-win is a positive-sum game where everybody wins, um, as opposed to a zero-sum game, which is bottom right, top left, zero-sum games. So there's got to be a winner and there's got to be a loser. We want collaboration. And we're approaching the end here. Um, as you gain knowledge, um, you need to understand this hierarchy of understanding, or, or how we go from pure data, this, this is modeled here as understanding symbols, like, okay, numbers, uh, what are uh, integers? Uh, I got just pure data. The data is organized, and then you have information. Okay, I know this is a social security number, that's their, that's their wage, that's the number of hours they work, et cetera. Then as you understand the relations, you start to see patterns, and this becomes knowledge. And it takes, uh, let's say, you, well, I, I can't. Uh, if you're studying uh, programming, uh, a programming language, first you have the data, the information, and the knowledge, and you understand how everything fits together. And then one day you wake up and you realize that you, you actually have some wisdom. You understand the principles, and you can apply them without even realizing that you're going that you've gone through this progression so we learn things this is why you study you say I'll never use this why am I studying this well you will learn it and it will turn into wisdom this is the other this is Bloom's taxonomy you may run into this again someday we start off by remembering things simply because it's going to be on the test so I've got to remember it then we understand it ah why was mx plus b it's so good except form of the linear equation Ah, and so uh, you know what slope is, and you know what the y-intercept, go get it. Then you learn how to apply it, and then you learn how to analyze the data, and then at the very peak of Bloom's uh, taxonomy is creation. You take all this accumulated, what started out as facts and understanding, it started out as knowledge, and it, it, you ended up creating something new, adding to uh, what you were Add to the inputs you were given, and you produce a brand new output, a creative. Um, so, I encourage you to go back to that slide from the Harvard Business article. Uh, review that. If you got any questions, email me. Um, and I love to talk about leadership, so don't hesitate to uh, contact me or just sign up for some of the courses, the management courses, the. Uh, team courses, etc. Thank you very much.